another episode of the Power Move Maker series. Um, I'm so honored and, and pleasured to have this man aboard this week, a true Power Move Maker in the music and entertainment industry. Fred, I'm not even going to try to say your last name, but the CEO of Media Takeout, Fred, fill in the blanks of the last name. Uh, my name is Fred Mwanga Gunga. Good to be here. How long did it take you to learn your own last name? Uh, it, 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 it came naturally to me, but I think yeah. for a lot of other people, it's a little harder. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know any different, right? Like, I thought everybody had these weird long last names when I was a kid, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of syllables. So, what, I mean, <laughs> I got to believe that, that African descent, what part? Uh, my family is from uh, the west, sorry, the east. The western part of Uganda, which is right around Rwanda. Okay. And yeah. did you ever have the opportunity to live there? Uh, no. I was born in the United States, grew up in Hollis, Queens, basically lived my whole life here. I've been lucky as I became an adult to go back and forth a little bit more. I've gone to Uganda a bunch of times. I've been to Rwanda and other places in Africa. But as far as like my upbringing and all that, I'm a Queens, Hollis, New York. Gotcha. Person. So, I mean, I got so many questions for you, Fred. And again, um, you know, you have built this amazing platform, really were on the front line of uh, the blogosphere in, in, in the African-American space with media takeout. But before we even get into that, I just want to learn just a little bit more about you. And as I was digging in and just doing some research, um, you come from the dry cleaning industry? Yeah, that was my kind of first foray into entrepreneurship. I was I went to law school and business school. Yeah. And I worked on Wall Street for a little while. But then I realized that an entrepreneur is always what I wanted to be. So I'd been sort of researching different industries and tried to figure out what was kind of a good space for me to start my first business. And dry cleaning seemed to make a lot of sense. And at the time it was the case and it's still the case right now is when you think of traditional mom and pop businesses, right? Like you think of a hardware store um, a stationary store used to be a mom and pop business. Um, a lot of those mom and pop businesses have all been kind of overtaken by a giant conglomerate. So it's where there used to be stationary stores, now there's staples. Correct. Where there used to be, you know, the hardware store, now there's Home Depot. And so there were these people that figured out ways of kind of consolidating these mom and pop businesses into giant billion, billion, multi-billion dollar conglomerates. And so my idea was to say, to, to, to do the exact same thing to the dry cleaning industry that Home Depot or Staples did to the stationery store or to, to the hardware store. So that was the idea behind it. It wasn't just that I wanted to get into the dry cleaning business. It was this idea of a bigger um, kind of move. Did you ever have any previous experience in dry cleaning? Did you grow up working in, in the dry cleaners or was this just I, an idea? I literally knew absolutely nothing about dry cleaning. I may have, before I, we, we started, the idea of the, the, the laundry and dry cleaning service. I probably did maybe 10 or 12 loads of laundry in my life. Really? So I didn't know, I didn't know anything about it. So I had to, I basically learned from scratch. I figured out how to do it We put together processes. I was lucky enough to speak with some, uh, some really good people that were in the industry for a long period of time, brought them on as consultants, kind of picked their brain, figured out how to do it. And a lot of it was kind of trial and error in the beginning, but I think we, we got up to speed pretty quickly and we put out uh, what I think was a really good product. How long were you in the business? I think it was about two years. Okay. So I want to yeah. take a step back and then I'm going to come back to this dry cleaning um, expedition you were on. Lawyer. Okay. Go to school for law. Did you ever actively practice, practice law? Yeah, I was a corporate lawyer on Wall Street doing, you know, the big business giant corporation deals. So I did that for, for uh, three and a half or four years. So it was, yeah, I'd been, I'd been kind of trained as that. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it, 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 I kind of fell into it, right? Like I, I never really wanted to be a lawyer. I knew I wanted to be in the kind of business that uh, made a lot of money um, that, you know, made me feel successful. And so, you know, a lot of times when you're younger, you kind of you can kind of find yourself in positions that you don't necessarily plan, right? Like there was it was like a series of accidents that led me to a school that I, and I chose pre-law as a major, 
And then when I kind of chose pre-law as a major, it just kind of made a lot of sense because I did really well in college to go to law school. And so I did. And then I went to law school and then I did pretty well in law school. And then the idea was, you know, if you're doing pretty well in law school, why not go to Wall Street, make a lot of money? And so I did. And so I was just kind of, it was like, it wasn't, it was never really a choice. It was always really, this kind of made a lot of sense to do. So why don't you kind of go into it? And so that's how I found myself in the practice of law. But I knew that wasn't what I really wanted to do. If it were up to me and I had the choice, I would choose to be an entrepreneur. And eventually I did. You know, um, you hit on some really great points. Um, just kind of these series of events that, you know, we all take. Everybody, and I'm assuming you, um, yourself, your parents from Africa know how big, um, you know, African parents are on education, um, and really going and, and seeking higher education. So, you know, myself, I know people who, you know, have been in school and they take these masters and they're going back for their PhD, but it's never really a plan. It's just kind of, you know, it's the right thing to do. It's the next thing to do. And it sounds good on paper. It sounds good when you're telling somebody, hey, I'm a lawyer, I'm going back to school for my doctorate, but it's like, do you love it? You know, is this something that you aspire to be? Is there a passion there? So even as I'm listening to you, my next question for you was going to be, okay, you're a lawyer, you want to be an entrepreneur, but why didn't you just go and open your own firm? But now I guess I have the answer. Yeah, I mean, that that's a good point. I mean, and, and I would have, right? If I had, you know, when I chose dry cleaning, I was looking for, you know, as an entrepreneur, I wasn't wed to a particular industry. I wasn't wed to practicing law. I wasn't wed to dry cleaning, obviously. I wasn't wed to media. I was looking for the best opportunity, an opportunity that fit within the skill sets that I developed over the time, over the years, and an opportunity where I thought that I could actually make um, make the kind of business that would make me happy, would make me a lot of money, would make me feel successful, and all of that. So if I would have come up with a plan to come up with a law firm that would have done that, Mm -hmm. At the time, I would have done that. I would have taken that road. That road was actually an easier road for me to take than the road of going to dry cleaning, which I don't know anything about. But I just, I just couldn't figure it out. So dry cleaning was the way to go. Why did you get out of the dry cleaning business? Well, I, it sold. I sold the sold the business. Nice. It was. It's yeah. It was. It's actually interesting because um, you know, I, I, you know, this this was now. I, I sold it. I think fifteen years ago, and I still look back. And, you know, even though it was probably the right time to get out, you know, it was a good offer. At the same time, I still feel like that was something unfulfilled because I know that we were on the right track to kind of build the kind of laundry and dry cleaning service that would be able to consolidate throughout the country and possibly throughout the world. And, you know, we got kind of tripped up a couple of ways and then we ended up selling the business. And now here it is 15 years later and nobody has done it still, right? So there, you still go and if you, you go to the dry cleaner, it's still a mom and pop place. So no one has figured out how to do it. And I, I, I'm i still convinced that we were pretty close to cracking the code on that. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, to a certain extent, there's, you know, a big hole inside of me that we ended up kind of giving up on that, even though it meant, you know, uh, cashing out in the business. 15 years ago, how old is Media Takeout now? Media Takeout is uh, f uh, 14 years. 14 year. years? Yeah. So you sell a business and you go right into Media Takeout? Uh, virtually, yeah. We, you know, it wasn't, we sold the business. It wasn't like, you know, it was, we were showered with cash and I was ready mm -hmm. to kind of retire. I was also pretty young at the time. So I had to kind of figure out what I'm going to do next. Now, luckily, while part of the reason why the dry cleaning business was so successful is we took a lot of, we, we're um, investing all of our advertising dollars into these kind of new websites called blogs that have come, yep. come, come about. At the time, there were maybe like three or four blogs and they were really popular. And while they were popular, it, they were flying under the radar. And so a lot of people just didn't really, they understood that they were popular, but they weren't, they didn't really understand the impact that they could have. So the blogs, I think, I know Perez Hilton, was one of the blogs that we advertised on. And, and if I'm not correct, I think we were his first ever advertiser. He Hold just on. had a blog. You, you advertised on Perez Hilton for your dry cleaning business? Yeah, he was, he was, he had just started his blog. It was kind of, it was popping. 
but it wasn't, he, he hadn't really figured out how to monetize it and put advertising on it. So I had been reading it. So I was like, hey, can we advertise on your site? And he was kind of like, yeah, okay, I guess you can. Right, like he didn't even know. This was just like, cause he hadn't, he hadn't been trained to think like that and no other blog was really advertising at the time. Mm -hmm. So we came in and we started advertising and we, we, the advertisement, he had a ton of audience right now. certainly not what he has, what he ended up having. But at the time he had a ton of audience and the advertisement was pretty cheap. I think we paid something like $250 a month for a hundred percent exposure on every page that he had, which is unheard of. Even unheard then it was unheard of. Unheard of. Um, and, and we did it because he was, he literally had no other advertiser that was advertising on his site. Now, I think after a month or two, he realized, Hey, I should be getting more money. And he, right, he, he moved up the prices and eventually he priced this out, but that's how we were doing it. We were advertising our blogs like Perth Hilton, Gothamist was another, another blog that's, that ended up get, being pretty big right now. In fact, with Gothamist, we weren't their first advertiser, but they had no like true homepage takeover ad capacity. Mm -hmm. So what we did is I, I was like, Hey, you know, we'd like to have a page takeover. And they were like, what's that? And I was like, well, why don't I hire a developer, redo your homepage and put our advertising in it and we'll pay to, to redo it. And eventually after our ad goes, you can, you know, sell this ad space to somebody else and we'll keep it there for a month. And they were like, great. And they charged us, I think they charged us like a thousand dollars for like a full page takeover for an entire, or a homepage takeover for an entire month, which is at the time completely yep. unheard of. Yep. Um, and like I said, eventually after the first month, they realized kind of that they were, we were underpaying and then they ratcheted up the price and eventually we got out. But we'd been advertising on the blogs all the way through and that had helped our business because we didn't have to spend a lot of money in advertising, but we were getting a ton of reach from the advertising dollars that we were spending. But then the second part of it is that when we, you know, I saw these the blogs, how quickly they were growing. I saw the revenues that I think by the time we we initially advertised with Press Hilton, it was something like 200 or $250 or $300 a month. By the time we sold the business, which was maybe a year and a half later, that same ad was going for $80,000 a month. On so Perez Hilton? On Press Hilton. Wow. So I knew it. I saw it. I was like, this is crazy. Now, the entire media, no one in the media knew this was happening. This wasn't like stuff you could go on Google and, and find an article about. Nobody really knew except me. And the only reason why I knew is because I was an advertiser. So when we sold um, um, the laundry spa and I was looking for another business, I was like, wow, these blogs are really growing incredibly fast. There's a real opportunity here. Whereas no one else saw it at the time. They thought, you know, that a blogger was just someone sitting in his mother's basement, you know, playing around on the keys. Um, what they didn't see is that this, there was a real uh, business opportunity here. Sorry about that. There was a real business opportunity here. And so I knew that when I was starting a new business, I wanted to go in an industry where there was clear growth, um, that the market hadn't necessarily recognized the growth that was on there. And you could, if, if you started in early, you can get what's called a first mover advantage, be one of the first to get on. Yep. And if you're one of the first to get on, as the tide rises, um, all boats rise to it. It's incredible this story you tell him because and, and it kind of segues us right into where I want to go. You're not necessarily a tech guy. Um, you didn't have any experience in the digital world, but by utilizing these blogs for a completely separate industry advertising, you're able to recognize, whoa, you know, there's a, there's a white space over here. I can fit and transcend right into what they're doing because I'm seeing how fast it's growing because <laughs> essentially you're paying for advertising, but you, 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 you're, you're able to calculate the dollars. You're able to say, Hey, uh, uh, 12 months ago, I was paying $250. Now it's $80,000 for the same placement. Very smart, very smart. Okay. So you sell your business. Get out of cleaning. Now you have direction. I want to go into this um, blogger space. It's really just starting to heat up. At the time, are there any other African American blogs that were really taking off? There were a couple. Uh, none of them had really, really popped, but there were a couple. Um, but one of the things that was different about certainly the early blogosphere 
is that the people that were doing it were doing it as a business, but it was mostly about fun. So they weren't really taking it like a real, they weren't really treating it like a real business. They were taking it, they were getting some money out of it, but they weren't doing it. Maybe they were doing it because they wanted to get closer to celebrities. Maybe they were doing it because um, they like showing pictures of themselves. Maybe they were doing it, you know, for the fame, maybe, they were doing, but they weren't, most of the people at the time that were doing it were not doing it as an actual business. And I'll give you an example of that. When we started, one of the things that all blogs did, and this isn't just the Affirmative blog, but all blogs, what they would do is, they would post on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then because they wanted to have their weekend to go party or go hang out with their friends, they would actually not post any stories on Saturday or Sunday. And then they would go back and post on Monday, right? And this is the way that every blog works. This is just the status quo. If you started a blog, that was kind of the culture of what you did. So one of the things that I did when I came in there is I was like, well, this is, that's crazy. Why would you do that, right? Like they're Clearly people want it are on the internet on Saturdays and Sundays. Clearly people want stories on Saturdays and Sundays. So the, one of the first things that I instituted is I was like, well, we are going to publish on Saturdays and Sundays. Not only are we going to publish on Saturdays and Sundays, we're going to pu publish double the content that we normally publish on Saturdays and Sundays. Because when we get those people that are coming from these other blogs because they can't go to their favorite blog, they go to us instead because we're the only ones with fresh content. We want them to have the best possible experience and possibly convert them into a media takeout reader. So, like I said, there were just it was this is these are things I think that are that seem fairly obvious right now to a lot of people, but at the time it certainly wasn't obvious. And people were kind of like, "Why are you doing this? What, what are you doing?" And I was just like, "Well, this is a real business. The customer, the people that you're talking to." They want the content and they don't just want the content on Monday to Friday. They have an insatiable appetite for celebrity content and we're going to provide it for them. We're going to be the place that's known for providing you as much celebrity content as you can handle. Okay. I want to take a back a step back for one second because there's a lot of entrepreneurs who are going to either listen to this on podcast or watch it on YouTube. How long did it take you to get this business off the ground? Because number one, the, 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 the space in terms of the platform, I, I don't know if WordPress existed back then and if it did, it was in its infancy or if it was in an earlier um, uh, iteration of what it has now become. So I'd like to know how long did it take you to get it off the ground? And number two, where'd you get the startup money from? Did it come from the selling of the business? Um, well, so with media takeout, it really didn't take that long because there really isn't, from a technical standpoint, there really isn't a ton of programming behind it then or now, right? Like now it's a little bit more with WordPress and all that. But back then before, if you were just programming it from scratch, which is what we did initially, there really wasn't a lot to do. So to, and, and they were, you know, while there wasn't WordPress, there was something similar. It was called Joomla at the time and you could use it. So there were ways that you could pretty inexpensively create a website even then. So at the time, maybe it cost a couple of thousand dollars to build the website. And then you had to buy like the domain name and whatever else. So all in, I was in under $3,000. So where did I get the money from it? It was, uh, maybe it was from the, wherever it was, $3,000. I had that money at the time. Mm -hmm. So wow. yeah, that, that, yeah, that, but, but that's, that's media, right? Like that's an internet business. Um, where, where the focus is on content, not on, um, not on uh, uh, technology. So I happened to luck into a business that really didn't cost that much to, to start. With the laundry business, it actually did cost a lot of money, right? Like we had to hire um, a whole bunch of um, experts to come in and explain to us what we did, put together a business plan, put together projections and a whole bunch of other stuff. We had to uh, get a warehouse space. There's a ton of equipment that we had to get. So that cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to put together. So depending on the kind of business that you're in, that's, you know, it, it, it can go from, you know, from $3,000, which is media takeout, which you know, I'm happy and lucky to have, you know, been uh, able to be a part of. And then the laundry service, which I, I don't even remember what it costs, but it costs many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars to set it up. I'm so surprised to hear that because I, I remember those early days and I'm not a tech guy. I'm not in a space like that. Uh, I just remember building a website. It, it felt like it cost so much. It was like, my I, I, listen, I, I got to tell you, I would talk to people that were like, that were other entrepreneurs that started other companies. And I remember there was someone else and I don't want to say the name of the company, but 
I was talking to him and he was like, yeah, you, you know, we just got built a new website and, you know, we spent a hundred thousand dollars. I was like, a hundred thousand exactly. dollars. Yes. <laughs> I could, I was like, I, I don't, I don't even know how I spent two thousand dollars, and I got like the extras. I got like rims on my website with two hundred, with two thousand dollars, right? So I don't know where this money goes. There are plenty of people out there that would sell you stuff that you didn't need. I was just focused on getting only the things that I needed, and that's part of the thing that I learned from my from the first business, right? When you when you're you start a business, and it's incredibly capital intensive, you spending hundreds of thousands of dollars just to run it for a month is costing you tens of thousands of dollars. So you know, you are counting every single penny. And that's what we were doing in the laundry service. And so that's the way that I had learned. That's the way I kind of was introduced to entrepreneurship. So when I then went to the second business, I wasn't there, I wasn't down to spend a penny that I didn't have to spend. And so, you know, I took kind of the skills that I got in the first business, transferred them into the second one. And that's kind of how I looked at it. And maybe some of the people that I went into just, this might've been their first business. And so, you know, they're learning that lesson that I learned uh, from the laundry service. Yeah, you're giving so much wisdom because as a fellow entrepreneur, that is one of the things that you learn really quickly is you have to count every penny. You do not want to spend an extra dime that you don't necessarily have to because you don't know what's around the corner. So it's very, very important to keep your costs down, profits high, keep your staff down. And speaking of that, you're running a blog, right? How big was your staff initially? Because you have to put out content seven days a week. Well, initially it was just me, right? And then, but after you're a while, then, stories? well, initially, right? This is 15 years ago. And we didn't, well, we were putting out content daily. We do, it was, it's a little bit different and it, it looked a lot different than, than it is today. So the majority of the content that we were putting out was actually link, external links to other sites. So maybe it was just, it was mostly just headlines and links. And then maybe there was like uh, an original content story, like one a week or so in the beginning. So it really wasn't an overwhelming amount of work, but it was a lot of work, right? Like you had to constantly know what's out there. You had to be able to write the headlines, you had to put it in there and, you know, get, get through the system. Um, so, but, but it, it wasn't like today where we're producing, you know, whatever, 30, 30 stories a day. So it, was, it looked nothing like that. Okay. So, and again, for any entrepreneurs out there who are watching, when did you know it was time to increase your staff? Well, two, there, there, there are two answers to that question. One is initially increasing staff is that I just didn't have the capacity to do it all, right? So at some point, if we wanted to move from one story a week, one original story a week to two or three or four, I just couldn't physically do it. So that was, you know, when, when, you know, you can't do it all, you, you, you bring people in. And so that was initially our way of hiring. So that's, that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question, uh, or the second answer to the question is, um, you know, as your business grows, how do you know to hire? And, and, you know, now you're not just hiring a bunch of assistants at some point, you're moving yourself out of kind of the day-to-day -day kind of grind of it. And you're trying to move into kind of managing, managing everyone, trying to keep uh, a vision of not just kind of, you know, what make sure that the stories go out well today, but make sure that the financial health of the company is good six months from now, a year from now. And so that's kind of a separate um, role when you're, when you're moving yourself out of kind of the grind and that mm -hmm. that'll come at some point in your, in your, as your, your business grows. Um, and then you start kind of layering management underneath you and kind of so that you can focus on the overall health of the business and not just kind of the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Did it take a long time to, to get that audience? At what point did you realize I'm really on to something? Like, you know, me transitioning into this blogosphere world, um, doing celebrity gossip and focusing on this, this African-American audience. Did it take a long time to build up your audience? Or did you see it right away? I saw it right away. I mean, you know, within a month or so, it was clear that there was traction and the traction was kind of going hockey stick up. Um, and that's just because when I came into the industry, the industry was blowing, like I said, whether I was in it or not, right? Like every, it wasn't just me, my traffic that was growing like that. Everyone that opened up a blog at that time, their traffic was growing like that too. So if you didn't have to be good, it was, it was, 
you didn't have to be good at it. You didn't have, you didn't have to do it professionally. You didn't have, to, and your, your, your traffic was just going to blow anywhere. That was just the trend of the world, right? Like there was this, these new things called blogs out there that everybody wanted to see. Um, a new way of looking and, and reporting celebrity news was out there. Um, there were people like Press Hilton that was really blowing up and helping driving the growth of blogs. And so our traffic blew, everyone in the industry's traffic blew. And like I said, I mean, I, I tell my friends this, if anyone that started a blog then and just stayed in it all the way through, made a ton of money, even if they were not even good, right? Because that was just the nature of it. If you got in that early and you had the ability to just kind of, you know, deal with it and stay in it, you turned out really well. In your opinion, what was the, because there was a lot of people who got into it. Very people survived over the long haul. You guys, you went through the roof. And I remember in particular, uh, your headlines were hilarious. You know, I was addicted to going to the site because, I, you know, the headlines were just so damn funny. What do you think the appeal of the site was? I, I, I'm speaking just from a consumer standpoint, but what was the appeal for, um, from your standpoint? I, I think what we did is we changed the way people thought about news, right? Like a lot of times news was done in a particular format, right? Like you made a, a headline that was supposed to be as nondescript as, po as possible. And then you wrote the headline. And even if you wrote about entertainment news, you didn't even, you, you tried to write an article that was, even if it was not necessarily a good thing about the celebrity, but you wrote in a way that actually made the celebrity look good. And that was just the way that we were conditioned to look at entertainment news. And what we did is we turned it all on its head. We, instead of kind of, we, we made it ridiculous. We made the idea of what we were talking about ridiculous because the idea of kind of reading about another celebrity's life is sort of ridiculous in its nature too. And we injected humor into it too, right? So we never took ourselves too seriously. We tried to, you know, a lot of times we made fun of, we made jokes and made fun of the celebrities without being mean spirited about it and just kind of put it all out there. And so when you read the story, most of the time after the headline in the story, you actually laugh. So in, in addition to kind of just learning a little bit about, of what, about what happened, you actually laughed. And that was it. It was the idea of kind of injecting humor into a news article at the time was just kind of, people didn't really see it. Um, and so when we did that, it was, we got an incredibly good response from the audience and we just kind of continued on that, that path. Was there one person in the audience, I mean, in your staff, that was just really good about these headlines? Or did you guys just stumble onto this and was like, oh, we're gonna keep going in this direction? We, so we, initially we, we, we were doing that. We were just kind of going about it. We had one person who actually is really funny at the time. And so they would write the headlines and they weren't intentionally trying to be funny, but they would just like, the person was really hood too. Mm -hmm. So they would just like writing stuff and they weren't intentionally trying to be funny, but, but it would be, right? And they wouldn't know. And so their stories were just doing particularly well. And so we just, we were like, wow, you know, just continue. And we allowed that person to just kind of open up and just um, be themselves in their articles. And, if, and, and eventually that, that, that culture, the, 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 that person's personality became infectious and everyone else started kind of taking that on. And that became kind of the culture of, the company so every time we would bring someone else new on they knew that this is the culture of the company and this is the writing style that we all had and so it, it just kind of worked like that do you remember what story if any was the one like you know i think about the breakfast club right and the breakfast club was great but the everybody in the world started talking about them after this ray j interview you know ray j goes on a rant and it just trends. Breakfast Club is the it spot. Was there one story like that for media takeout? I don't know the answer to that. And maybe there was, right? Like there were, there were a bunch of stories that kind of took us to another level, right? Like when you, when you break new news, and now, like I said, this is all 15 years ago. I don't even remember what the news story was. I think we had a big story when we broke that Michael Jordan was going through a divorce. That kind of helped us, right? I think one of the things that helped us more than others is that we developed a relationship with Wendy Williams. 
And Wendy Williams, obviously the uh, talk show TV host right now, she's uh, killing it on TV. But at the time she had a radio audience and she, just like she has now, she had a really very loyal uh, audience. And so she started, she, she fell up on the site. She liked it. And she would talk about the site during her radio show. I mean, she, she was talking for four hours and she needed stuff to talk about. So sometimes she would just call me to take and be like, Oh, listen, what media take I was talking about today. And so as she would tell her audience that her audience would be like, Oh, well, let me see what this media take out is talking about. And then they would go online. And so what that did is that she already had a built in gigantic audience. Mm -hmm. And what it did is it got her audience to become fans of media takeout because she endorsed it. And so I think, you know, if there's, so I can't say necessarily that there was one particular story that did it. I do think that the endorsement of someone that had incredible credibility with our fan, with millions of, of people, that was, I think, the biggest thing that happened to us. And I tell her that till today. That's so nice, that's, that's great. Um, speaking of audience, at your peak, media takeout's peak, how many visitors are you seeing a day? Well, I think the peak is right around now. I mean, we're at, yeah, we're at, uh, I think last month we hit 34 or 35 million people on, on the site. So, you know, it's, it's definitely going very well right now. Incredible, incredible. I mean, and there's so many little things that I see with Media Takeout because you guys are actually featured on the homepage of TMZ. Is that something that you plan for? Is that relationship based? Did they just figure out that you guys are the source for all of the entertainment news in the African American and urban space? Well, we've had a great relationship with the folks over at TMZ for many years. We quote them a lot, right? Like obviously they're breaking some really great stories. We give them credit when they break stories um, and they do the same for us. So I think it's, you know, when you've been in the industry for as long as we have and as long as they have, and you have a long, long standing relationship, then you don't, you feel comfortable um, sharing audience, right? Like they feel comfortable saying, hey, this is a, 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 a source. This is a site that we've been dealing with for a long time. They're producing quality content go check them out. And we do the same thing with them, right? Like we were confident. I, I mean, I know all the people over there, including Harvey and them, and they do a great job with news. And so when they break a story, which they do frequently, we uh, send our audience there too. That's amazing. 36 million. Yeah. So you guys are still growing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's more too, right? Like we, 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 when we started out, we were primarily the, the, the majority of our audience was African-American women. And then we kind of grew into African-American men. Um, and now, our, in addition to having African-American women and men, as our, they're still our primary audience, but we have just a large swath of Americans and people around the world that, that are our media takeout now too. Okay, so, you know, one of the things that any business fights for is an audience, consumers, returning consumers. Media takeout, you guys seem to, to have stayed in a certain lane over the years. Um, as a lot of your competitors have gone into the social media space, I haven't seen that as much from media takeout. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, you know, social media, I think, has a value, right? And I think that there, there are tons of people that are on it for kind of the quick fix news. And so if you're going to be in kind of the quick fix news business, you know, basically a meme, a photograph, and, you know, a paragraph, then I think that's a great space for you. But we decided probably about three years ago that we were going to, and that was, that was the lane that we were in up until three, three years ago, before kind of the social media explosion. So I guess to a lot of people, it would have made sense to just say, hey, why don't you just transition and go on to social media? All right. And to, 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 uh, to me, that was a very dangerous thing to do because essentially what you're doing is, you know, and a lot of times people say, you know, I'm on, you know, I'm on Instagram or YouTube and this is my platform, but it's not your platform. Right. And it's not your audience, right? It's YouTube's platform and YouTube's audience. It's Facebook's platform and Facebook's audience. It's Instagram's platform and, and Instagram's audience. And now if you, if you never had a platform to begin with, then I think it's a great idea to go on to places like YouTube and, and Facebook and Instagram to develop an audience because you're leveraging their audience to, as your own. And I think that's a great opportunity for you. 
But if you do already have an audience and you do already have a platform, why would you give it up? Because that's what you'd be doing to join YouTube or Facebook or Instagram's platform. And from that standpoint, it doesn't make sense, right? So we were kind of at a different crossroads, which was to say, okay, if, if you know, this kind of quick fix, a photograph and a paragraph news is all going on social media and you're not gonna go on social media, how do you change and how do you adjust your business so that it remains relevant, right? So that it continues to grow. And what we did is we said, we said well, okay, there's, you know, it's a great idea to have, you know, stuff on social media, but my bet at the time was that people don't just want a photograph and a paragraph. They might want to see a photograph and a paragraph at first, right? So that they know what's going on. But then after that's almost just, you just wet their whistle, right? Like they're like, okay, yeah, I see this photograph of Nicki Minaj doing something crazy. And I read this paragraph that said that she did this, but that hasn't stopped their appetite for kind of wanting more information about what exactly has happened. So what in fact, what people do is after they see a photograph or an image, maybe they'll go on Google and say, oh, let me read about it. Maybe that'll hit them in their mind and be like, okay, I got to read more about it. Let me go on media takeout and see exactly what goes on. And that's exactly the, what they do. So while initially there was kind of like some turbulence in our traffic, eventually we saw that that, that in fact is the way that people behave. And that's in fact is what, what has happened. And that's what has uh, sustained our traffic. I love, you know, you speaking as a as the head of a company, you're, you're recognizing trends, um, you're understanding the behaviors of your audience and the audience as technology changes the world. And you kind of took a stance that we're going to continue on our own path. And I think that for anybody watching, there's this fine line, right, of, you know, because because things happen in phases, they happen in waves. Um, you know, at one point, this might be hot, then something else becomes hot. And I see a lot of business owners trying to chase um, trends and not having a, 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 a commitment to their own vision and really planting their flag in the ground and saying, okay, you know, I get that this is where the market's going or this is what our competition is doing, but our audience behaves a certain way. Is that something that is just innate with you? Are you going by the metrics? Are you going by the numbers when you're taking these stands? Or are you just looking and saying to yourself, you know what? I understand that our competition is going a certain way, but I just know in my heart of hearts how our audience behaves and what they react to. And we're gonna focus on what we do best. Well, I mean, one, it's not an easy decision to make. And two, it's not the kind of thing that, um, that you come to easily, right? So for me, I mean, remember when we, when we were talking earlier, I told you that, you know, when, as your business grows, you kind of move out of the role of kind of doing the day to day and you're kind of looking at the vision. Like coming up with those strategies and recognizing what goes on um, with our audience and recognizing which trends you should take a look at and what you shouldn't. That is my job. That's 100%, like 95% of my job is that. The other 5% is, you know, making sure that everybody's doing well and, you know, making sure that the stories kind of look okay, right? But that's, that's done by other people. My job is to set the direction for the company. My job is to make sure that six months from now, a year from now, we're in a good position. And so, you know, while that's a tough decision and to a lot of people, they might be like, you know, you know, how do you come up with this or whatever else? If you spend your whole day, like I literally will spend, I might spend 300 hours and I'm not underestimating it. I'm not, I'm not over, overstating it either. I might have spent 300 hours thinking and talking and researching before I came up with that decision. So that, that's the culmination of months worth of work you know, staying up late at night, reading a book, you know, reading articles, taking a look at metrics and analytics. That's the culmination of it, right? That coming up with this idea, this strategy, this plan. And that's, I think if you're gonna run a successful business, that's the way you have to do it. When you look at, you know, uh, some of the big multinational corporations, that's what these CEOs are doing. They're not, you know, you know the, the CEO of GM, he's not, 
you know, looking at the car doors and whatever. So there's a whole bunch of other people underneath him that's doing that. He's taking a look and he's saying, okay, where is the electric car market going? Should we be, you know, going in that direction, right? Which has nothing to do with the current cars that they're building today, right? Like everything he's thinking about is kind of going towards the future. And so that's, you know, that's, you know, when I come to a, to a decision like that, it's after a lot of talking to, to other people, a lot of thinking and a lot of research. I know it had to be scary for you because again, you know, I speak to many entrepreneurs and there, there are these up moments, there are these down moments. And when you're down, a lot of time you are, you, you're scrambling for answers. You, you, you don't know what's the best course I should take. Um, so I commend you on that. And I think anybody who is watching, um, no matter what industry you're in, it's so vitally important to take your time, do the research, understand your consumer base before you make a decision. Because sometimes it really, you know, but it comes down to number one, staying true to my vision. But in some cases you have to make a pivot and you have to make a pivot in real time to keep those doors and those lights on. So I commend you on that. Right. I will say another thing too that you can do is, you know, if you want to see whether or not it's a right decision, a lot of times you can look at other people, right? You can look at like, like I said, I have a great relationship with TMC. You can look at TMC. TMC is not putting all their content on YouTube or Facebook or, or Instagram or anything like that. They might put some on there, right? But they're not actively just throwing all their stuff on there. They still recognize that they have to maintain their website. And so, you know, when you start looking around and nobody else is doing it, now, maybe that could be that none of them know what they're talking about and it's the right way to go. And that, 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 that's a very right, real possibility. But the other thing might be that, you know, jumping in the water like this is not the smartest thing to, to, to do. And, you know, just to give an example, I, a friend of mine, you know, one of the things that, you know, when you're the head of a company and you've been around for a while, you get to know the heads of a whole bunch of other companies, right? I, I know the heads of a whole bunch of other digital media companies. And one of friend of mine, he ran, digital media company, incredibly successful. Um, they raised, I think they raised like $60 million. And he took the opposite approach. So what he did is he decided to put all of his traffic, for him it was on Facebook. So he basically, essentially um, didn't close down his website, but basically moved um, almost all of um, his content onto Facebook. And it was an incredible boom for the company. It, the company grew like, like gangbusters. And you know, as it's growing, I'm kind of like, Damn, am I making the wrong decision? You know, maybe I should do this, do what he did. Um, and what happened is within like six or seven months after the kind of the boom, Facebook had an algorithm change and overnight his entire traffic disappeared. And he went from a company that had just raised $60 million to, I think it was a month or two after Facebook made the algorithm change, he was out of business. His company was closed. Mm -hmm. And he had no company. So that's how serious it is. When you're making that choice and you're making that leap, you are putting all your eggs because they can, whatever they want, for whatever reason, they could just say, we're shutting it down. It could be a good reason. It could be a bad reason, right? It could be, you know, you wrote something bad about Trump and someone in the Trump administration called up Facebook and said, get that, get that, uh, get that channel off. And don't get me wrong, that happens all the time. And then boom, they'll just shut it off because to them it doesn't matter, right? Like it's like, you might think that you're big and you might think that you have a big business and a lot of traffic and whatever else, but you're nothing compared to the billions of, of users that Facebook and Instagram have or, or YouTube has. And then, and they also know that within three months, all of your audience is just gonna go to the other similar places as you. And then, uh, you know, everything's over. So they, you have to realize that they have absolutely no problem completely shutting down your business. And they shouldn't, right? Because their business is to continue their business. And if, you know, if Donald Trump is going to interrupt their business, if they don't shut your website down, they have no problem at all shutting your website down. Speaking of Trump, um, media outlets around the world have been under fire for fake news. Everything is fake news, fake news, fake news. How's that impacted your life? How's that impacted the stories that you choose to run on your site? Well, it's interesting, right? Because like before Trump, when you said fake news, it actually meant something, right? It actually meant this is news that is not real, right? 
But now that Trump is in office, when Trump says fake news, that doesn't mean that it's fake, right? It could be very real news, right? Like he says the New York Times is fake. He says that CNN reports are fake, right? Like, and these are very, these are real reported news stories, right? And so what it did is what I think the presidency of Trump did is it opened up the fallacies of the world, right? So now it's obvious as day that, that uh, when Trump says something is fake, it's not that it's in fact fake, it's just that he doesn't like it, right? He doesn't agree with that it. That was almost, that was, or he doesn't agree, he might, he might agree with it, he might just not like it, right? Like someone says something bad about him, it's fake. It's automatically fake, right? No matter what it is. And that has always kind of been what the definition of fake news is. If the person that's writing, you're writing about, just doesn't like it, they'll just say fake news. But before Donald Trump, you would just say, oh yeah, that's fake, right? But now Donald Trump, you might be like, well, just because they say it's fake news, maybe it isn't. So at the end of the day, what you're really looking at is, you know, what is, what is, what a lot of times people call fake news is the news that goes outside of the, what everyone else is saying. So if you were, you know, two months ago, I mean, we're in the middle of, uh, of the COVID-19 epidemic in, in the United States, it's in, you know, um, if this were January and you wrote an article saying, you know, that COVID-19, you know, there's a good amount of research that says that COVID-19 is going to be an international pandemic and it may cause, you know, uh, dozens of countries around the world to shut down. Everyone in January would say that that's fake news. They would say that that's fake news. They would say that that's fear mongering. That's, but it's true, right? Like now in hindsight, we can look back and say that that was a true story. But at the time, you couldn't get any legitimate uh, news publication to publish that, even though the information was out there. And the reason why they wouldn't publish it is not because it's not true, because it in fact is true, but it's because it just wouldn't be well received um, by the public or by their peers across media. So I think that's what it is. And so like, to me, I just kind of ignore that because it's just noise. And what you really are trying to do is you're trying to produce the best, most entertaining uh, and, um, and most informative content that you can for your audience. Um, and then you allow time to show um, whether or not it's quote unquote fake news. Okay. So to my earlier question, are there stories that you wouldn't run? And, and I asked you this for a separate reason. A good friend of mine, Vlad, everybody knows him, Vlad TV. This is a guy who, you know, he is the, the owner of a multi-million dollar business. You know, he does very well for himself, but he walks around with security because a lot of the times the things he reports on some of the people he's reporting on get pissed. And now he has problems. Have you ever faced, you know, and it's so crazy because he is the CEO of a multi-million dollar business. And it's not like he's walking around with security because he's worried about somebody robbing him. He's worried about somebody he reported on, even if the news is true. So have you guys, or you in particular, faced anything like that? No, I mean, I think, Vlad is dealing with hip hop artists, right? And these, and whenever you're going to deal and you're going to piss off rappers, particularly, you know, some of the younger rappers, you're going to be, you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble. And what we do is we probably pretty early on have steered away from all of that. So we don't write about any hip hop beefs. We don't write about any of that stuff because there's severe consequences to that. Not, not, not for me or whatever. But for the people involved, right? Like people are in fact getting killed from a lot of this stuff. People are in fact going to jail for some of the stuff that they're saying online or, or doing online, right? So from a, just from a moral standpoint, the question is, do we even want to be a part of that, right? It's different when you talk about, you know, is so-and-so cheating on their girlfriend, right? Who, for all you know, in six months, they're probably not going to be together. And then the, the story doesn't mean anything to them, right? Um, or if you say, you know, so-and-so, you know, snitched on so-and-so. And so, you know, where there are real implications for that. There may be jail implications, there may be violent implications, there might be even death. So that's it. I think it's two totally different worlds. Um, and so we try and stay away from all of that because at the end of the day, and, and you know, one of the things, I know I keep coming back to the audience and the consumer and what it is that you want. At the end of the day, you want the consumer to come to your site, 
get informed, maybe have a couple of laughs and leave happy, right? If you're writing about people killing each other and people fighting each other and whatever, people aren't happy, right? Like people, people start to say, well, why do I come to that place? It's just gonna bring me down, you know, with all the kind of craziness that's out there, right? Like they're talking about violence and all this other stuff. So if you're, if you're trying to make people happy when they leave, right? Like you are writing different kind of content. And so, you know, I guess the, 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 the short answer to the question is, are people unhappy with some of the stories that we write? Yes. A lot of times they're unhappy, right? And, some, and a lot of times they call me up and sometimes I'll see them and they'll tell me about it, right? But there's never anything that we do. And if there was ever anything that we thought were, you know, by reporting the story, we might get someone physically harmed or get them put in prison or, you know, something like that, then we just wouldn't run the story. One, because, you know, from a kind of moral standpoint, you just don't even want to be a part of that. Um, but from even a business standpoint, those are the kind of things that turn your audience off. Short term, you may get a click from it and people might be like, oh yeah, let me, let me read about this hip hop beat. But in the long term, it might, it gives people like a bad feeling about visiting the site. So it might be like, okay, I, I, I kind of enjoyed that, but I'm kind of, I, I wish I never read that or I wish I never saw that or, you know, so from a business standpoint, it doesn't make sense. From a moral standpoint, it doesn't make sense. And so for a lot of, for all of those reasons, the kind of kind of, the kind of stories that have heavy impacts on people's lives, the kind of stuff I think that, that Vlad is talking about, that he's worried about, are, are stories that we just, we just don't touch. You wouldn't touch? No. Understood. You have a huge audience to this day. You know, you just shocked the heck out of me. What do you do with them? I watch in, in you know, as a businessman, you, you, you watch others, you know, who are more successful because you want to aspire to be more successful. Right now, if you have millions of people coming to your site daily, let's take a TMZ. TMZ has, you know, they have a half hour show um, on terrestrial television. They've segued into TMZ sports. You go to LA, they're doing, you know, celebrity tours where they're showing you where the celebrities live. Do you have plans to, uh, to leverage your audience outside of the dot com? And if so, what are they? Well, I think we've explored over the last 14 years a ton of options. So we've, ex we've gone down the TV road. Um, spoken to just about every network that's out there. Um, the folks over at Bravo were interested. We, VH1, Eva, um, everyone, or a lot of people. We, we, we actually were working with a distributor to get a, uh, a syndicated show. We've done, we've tried all of that. We've tried the tours, of the, the um, um, uh, events, everything, right? And, and from the TV side, the TV side is different. It's difficult because I think a lot of times TV wants to do it a certain way, right? So like, let's say you're on Bravo. Bravo has a formula of for what a Bravo show looks like. And, they're, and if they're gonna put together a media takeout show, they're gonna make a media takeout show look like a Bravo show, look like The Housewives, right? Because they, all the shows kind of have that same format, right? A bunch of people, right? fighting each other, cat, cat fighting and stuff. And the question that you have to have when you're running the business and you're kind of, uh, you know, taking a, 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 a wide vision of it is, is that the right, would that work for your audience, right? Because at the end of the day, you want to produce the kind of content that you think your audience would love to have, wants to see. And if you can't say that you would, then you shouldn't do it, right? And so we've gone, at, you know, the, if, if you call them up, like let's say I got on the phone with the folks over VH1 tomorrow, they'd be like, yeah, let's sit down. And then, you know, but we've been down that road, right? They'll, they'll, build, they'll get it together. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we can do Love and Hip Hop and it'll just be, you know, called Media Takeout. And I'm like, well, Love and Hip Hop kind of has its lane. It's good for what it is. We have to do something different, right? And the ideas that we have and the ideas we have coming to the table, it just does it might not fit within what VH1 is just doing, right? VH1 might just be like, that might, that 
you know, and we've gone to, to, to places. We were, we were pretty close with a, with a network, I don't want to say, and they were, they came to us with an idea for a show. And we were like, look, we're going to get a production company in. We're going to put it together. This is going to be a show that everybody's going to be interested in. We'll explain why we actually spent money to do like focus, focus testing, right? Like we shot a sizzle reel. We did everything and everything, everyone over there, the people over, we, oh, sorry, the, the network were like, yes, we like it. And, you know, everybody was like, this is perfect. But they were like, this just isn't our show though. This isn't, this is, this doesn't fit into what it is that we're doing, even though it's good, even though it would get ratings, even though, you know, we might actually all be happy with the, the way that it comes out. There was no one there that was willing to kind of take the risk and say, we're going to do something different. Right. And that's just the nature of the way the TV is. TMZ is a little bit different because when TMZ was formed, TMZ was a partnership between AOL and telepictures and telepictures uh, is a distributor of syndicated television, right? So when they started that site, they started the site with the 100% knowledge that eventually they were gonna come up with a show. So they, you know, by the time that TMZ.com went live, they already had, you know, TV execs buying into the idea that the TV show was gonna come out, right? So they didn't have to convince people into doing this or they, they convinced people before they even decided to launch a site we are in a different position. We have to convince people to step outside of what they're doing, to do things differently. Um, and that in the television world is just very difficult. I've tried it. Like I said, I've gone and I've worked with you. I've worked with every network. I can tell you, you know, certainly all the, all the, the, the cable networks that you could think of that would host a show like this. We've sat down and had serious conversations with them. Um, with the syndicators, we were working with uh, Sony and we got fairly far along with it and it kind of get to, got down to the same world, right? Like they're used to producing judge shows and stuff. And we're like, well, can we like make it a media takeout judge show? No, we can't, right? Like this, is, can't, this isn't what we do, right? Like it has to kind of be this. And if we do this and we got the research, it could work. Um, and then we went, so we, 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 we went down that road. Then we went into scripted television. So I was like, okay, well, we can't get this into like regular television. Let's go into scripted. And so we had it, we had like, we got CAA to come in on board. We had like some, some of the top writers, writers on a lot of the programming so that you might know came on board. They wrote up a treatment, we got it through. <laughs> We took it to, to the networks and networks loved it. And it, it just, it fell down to the same role. It was like, okay, well, you know, we have this, but you know, we'd like to have, you know, at the time it was Empire was 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 hot. They were like, okay, but you know, um the, the script you have, it looks kind of like Empire. Like, well, it's not really like Empire. They're like, well, but you know, CBS has this new thing called Empire. And they didn't know that Empire was going to be a hit at the time, but they just knew that Empire was was, was bought. And they were like, well, it's too it's too close to Empire, can we change it like this? And then change it into something like a sitcom. And I was like, well, that's not that's not what we were doing. So the long story is all of these opportunities are out there. The great thing is when you have the kind of audience that we have, we've been around as long as we've been in, it's not hard to get them to sit down and talk to you about it seriously. But what I've found is, you know, they're going to try and put out the kind of stuff that might be bad for your brand. And so one of the networks we were working with, the, the one that I talked about that we had all the research and everything, they ended up passing on us. They're like, we can't do it. And then they went to, they went somewhere else and they had got someone else to buy into the format that they originally pitched us. And the show was as terrible as I thought it would. The ratings were terrible. And you know, it was, it was just a debacle at, the, at the, the network. And they knew it. They knew it at the time. We all knew it. Um, but that's just, like I said, it's just not the way the TV works. So it's, that's TV. Radio has its own problems and, and a lot of other things. So um, I've been talking for a while, but the, 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 the long story short of it is that we, I am looking at all these opportunities. I do take these meetings, you know, in addition to kind of sitting around and spending hundreds of hours thinking about whether or not to go on Facebook or social media, it's taking meetings with people like that and trying to develop those kind of relationships. And, you know, for every, you, you go out there with 10 of them, nine of them don't work. And then sometimes you end up with a positive relationship that, that turns into something. So the fact that it hasn't happened doesn't mean that we're not actively looking at it, trying and exploring them. Um, even now, there's 
stuff on the table right now that I'm, I'm looking at and, you know, I'd love to kind of get it together. Um, but I, I just think it's one of those things like you just got to keep on working every single day. And eventually if something's meant to be and it's the right, the right way, uh, I think it'll happen. Couple more questions for you. Just listening to you, you know, myself, like every other entrepreneur, we're not driven by money. We're driven by passion. We're driven by love. We're driven by that thing that keeps us up at night and wakes us right back up first thing in the morning. With all the challenges that you faced, do you still love what you do? I do. I, I got to say, this is, and I've worked consistently. I started working when I was uh, 14 years old, and I've basically worked ever since. Through high school, through college, through law school, business school, right after. I've worked in many different jobs. I've worked in fast food. I've worked uh, uh, videotaping weddings. This is by far the best job that I've ever had. It's beautiful. It's fun. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it, you know, when you think about it, right? Like it's, I know I, I, I say that I'm kind of spending all this time thinking about stuff, but I also spend a lot of time like watching YouTube videos, right? Like think about it. My job, part of my job is sitting around watching, watching your show, right? Like that is, that's actually part of my job and then actually an integral part of my job, right? Because I have to know what's going on out there. So when you look at kind of what, it, what my job is, it's a fantastic job. And I think the best part of it is just knowing how much joy that people get, right? Like there are millions of people tomorrow morning will go on to media takeout and laugh, right? Just knowing that and say, wow, I'm glad that I saw this, right? Or they're gonna talk to have something to talk to their friends about. To know that you're having that impact on people, right? And it's not just me, it's the whole staff and everyone else. It's a, it's a really beautiful feeling to have, right? And so, you know, in that sense, it's almost like being an entertainer or an artist, right? Like if you're an artist and you put up a, a painting and you go back and you see people enjoying themselves looking at it, it's a great feeling to have. It's, a, it's what we all want, right? Like in, in life, right? Like we want to make sure that whatever we do, that it's being appreciated. And I get to know that what we're doing today is going to be appreciated by millions of people. That's a fantastic feeling. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. Businesses, you're an entrepreneur. Businesses are made to be sold. Would you ever sell? I would. Um, but the thing about selling is if I were to sell, right, I'm still a young man. Now I got to go get another job, right? Because I was not going to let me sit at home. I gotta go find another job and I'm not, I know I'm not gonna like the job as much as I like this job, right? No matter what it is. So that's always the thing you're thinking about. You're like, well, I, if you love what you're doing and it's working, like why would you ever kind of get out of it? Um, so that's kind of my thoughts in it all. So to me, I would rather, instead of rather like selling and just kind of getting out, cashing out or anything like that, which I'm not particularly interested in. Now you give me the right offer, I have no choice to, to get it. But then, you know, it's one of those things like, I would do it and then I'd come back kind of like with the laundry service and it would be five years later and we'd be having this conversation. I'd be like, you know what? I never, I never should have done it. I, could, I, I still had these other things I could have done, you know, and just knowing that that's the way it is. And because the business is going so well right now, it's kind of like, why, why would you do it? So to that extent, I really don't want to, right? Like if someone gave me some ridiculous offer, I would take it and then I would regret it. But that's what I do. If anything, it will be more so like, being a part of something bigger, right? So instead of like selling, maybe if you said, oh, you know, we're gonna, you know, merge MTO and TMZ, right? And then you could figure out how to kind of do this or that, right? Something like that would be more appealing to me, even if it meant a hell of a lot less money because it keeps me going, right? Like this, at the end of the day, like you said, this really isn't about money, not for the people that are doing it and, have been doing it for a long time and are doing it well, it really isn't about money. I mean, you think about it, right? Like even when people look at like someone like Mark Zuckerberg or whatever, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, Ooh. he's doing it for money. Think, think about Mark Zuckerberg's journey, right? Like at some point when he had Facebook, somebody said, I'm gonna give you a million dollars for it. And he said, no. Then somebody said, I'll give you a hundred million dollars for it. He still said no. Then somebody said, I'm gonna give you a billion dollars for it. He still said no. Now they'll be like, I'll give you $100 billion for it. And he still says no. He says, no, I don't want it. I'm going to show up to work every day. I'm going to work 
14 hours a day. I'm, I'm going to take no vacations. I'm going to do all that. Like, he's got all the money in the world, right? Like, he's never going to be able to spend his money. He, if he spent a, as much money as he could every single day, he couldn't do it. And he still goes to work 14 hours a day killing himself, you know, going in front of Congress dealing with this. He's not doing this for money, you know? And I think that's the way a lot of us are. We're not doing this for the money, right? Like, this isn't, this is about, we want to see this through. We love what we're doing. And so we're just going to hang around until we don't want to. And then, you know, we'll step out. Not to make myself, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or anything. But it's kind of the same. I'm, we're, I'm not alone in this. It's not just me and him. You know, it's all of us that think this way. Last question for you. There's an entrepreneur out there watching this. What advice do you have for him or her? I'd say um, entrepreneurship is an incredibly difficult journey. It's one that you have to be built for. And you either know it or you don't, right? Like you might, entrepreneurship is not a side hustle that you're gonna make a whole bunch of money off of. I mean, that, that's something, that's a part of entrepreneurship. But if you really want to be an entrepreneur, you're going to have to endure uncertainty. And I think uncertainty is what knocks most people out of entrepreneurship. People think, oh, you know, you become an entrepreneur. The people leave entrepreneurship because they run out of money. No, you could find money. You know, you could scale down costs. You could do a whole bunch of things to get through that. But the uncertainty to know, you know, the thing about entrepreneurs, you got to go to sleep tonight and get a good night's sleep, sleep like a baby, knowing that tomorrow everything could be gone. And you gotta be, every day, go to sleep like a baby like that, I wake up in the morning and be like, is it gone? Oh no, it's not, okay, continue with it, right? And next day, same thing, next day, same thing. And some people, they just can't deal with it. And if you are the kind of person that can't deal, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to make any kind of judgment because it's kind of crazy to even be that kind of person to be okay with that kind of thing, right? So th if anybody has something wrong, it's probably us that actually can go to sleep like that, right? Like the average person shouldn't be able to go to sleep like that. But if you have this entrepreneurial drive and you are okay with the idea of uncertainty in your life forever, then I say wholeheartedly go into it. Read, you know, find entrepreneurs that you like. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of really great entrepreneurs men and women, certainly men and women of color, write autobiographies, not just some biographer that's telling you what they do. An autobiography, Oprah Winfrey has one, um, Russell Simmons has one, I'm pretty sure Diddy has one. Uh, Chasey has in the, the, the one by uh, Dream Hampton. It's not necessarily written by him, but I think she's a pretty good um, 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 author and, and, pretty, and she knows him very well. So you could read what it is that they did, the struggles that they have and the struggles that they continue to have and use that as kind of your 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 um, your uh, platform on a, how to go about things, right? Like you'll see that people are, you know, what happened when you know when Rock Nation split up, right? Like we know the story, but when you read it from their words or someone that's really close to them, you might find that you know some of the tactics that were used by Jay Z in that scenario might be applicable to some of the things that you're dealing with right now in your current business, right? And I think that, that to me is, was the biggest thing, right? Because I didn't have a whole bunch of uh, mentors. I didn't have some entrepreneur that knew everything that said, hey, Fred, sit down and let's talk about it. What I did is I was like, well, this, I'm gonna try and read all these books. So I read the autobiography of, um, of Sam Walton from Walmart. I read the autobiography of uh, um, Cornelius Vanderbilt. So I was, I was trying to find all these different people and, they would, and a lot of times they would, they, would, they would give you descriptive things about what happened. I mean, when you read, if you read one book, read the book on, read Sam Walton's book. He tells you like how before he started Walmart, like he had started a business and then it failed. He started a, a uh, essentially the, the, the predecessor of Walmart and it failed completely. And he had to pick himself up from the dirt and he had a, uh, his wife and, and young children in that home. And he had to build it all back up from scratch. And he explains, he explains what went wrong, what he learned, you know, and, and just those kind of scenarios, those situations will help you, right? Like as you're dealing with the uncertainty, as you're dealing with, you know, you don't know what to do, you get to look at all these different people that were in these different situations 
and try and take what they got, right? Like there's, there's so many things. I know the one, the one thing, one time that I actually did get good advice from, from certain people, there was a couple of people and they had been entrepreneurs for a long time. And they were like, if you're ever in this situation, don't do it. And so the situation, do you want to go through it or? Feel free. Okay. So um, a good friend of mine was in a situation. He ran a business. He ran a very successful business. It was an urban business. And they were growing like crazy. And so they decided that they wanted to expand their business. And so what they did is they were like, um, they had a choice. They could either go out and sell a portion of the company so that they can, they would get, um, they have to have partners. They'd own the company and then now they have partners. Or they could go and get a bunch of debt from a bank. In that, in that case, they didn't, they didn't have any partners. They just had to pay the debt back in the bank. They decided that they wanted to own 100% of the company and they went and got the money from the bank. Eventually things went bad. The bank bankrupted the company and the bank actually took control of the company. Fast forward about 10 years into, into media takeout. I was faced with that exact same concern. I, was, I wanted to expand the company. There were people that were coming in. They were like, we'll give you the money, but we'll come in as partners. Or the bank was willing to come in and give me incredibly favorable terms to some money. And so I went back to that, that, that person and I was like, you know, listen, I'm in the same position as you. And he was like, listen, Fred, you might have gone to the business school. You might have done this. You might have done this. I will tell you right now, don't ever take, don't take the bank's money. I don't care what you do. Don't take the bank's money. You could take the, the, the equity people's money. I don't know. Maybe that turns out well, maybe it doesn't. But I know for certain, if you take that bank's money, it will, you will end up in the exact same situation that I was in. And for no other reason, other than that guy's word, I turned it down. I turned down the bank money. I ended up not going with the equity money either. I just said, I'm not doing it. And looking back, it was a, a great move because one of our biggest competitors in this industry was faced with the exact same decision. And they took the bank's money and they lost their company. So I can tell you, you know, so there's stuff like that. That's the kind of stuff that you can pick up in books. You could pick up by not necessarily a book, reading a business book, how to this and that, just somebody's story. And you just realize, wow, I don't want to be in that position that they're in. This was kind of the circumstances that they were in. I never want to be in that position right there. And had I not had that conversation with that guy, I probably would have taken the money just like our competitor did. And I probably would not have this company right now. Incredible gems. Wow. Wow. Incredible gems. And that's, you know, I got to believe somebody's going to watch this and this is going to be the blessing. This is, you know, without even realizing it, hearing what you just said, learning from your own experience is going to be their blessing and hopefully will, will keep them from losing their company. Right. Right. I mean, because there are so many ways that you can lose it. So the more that you read, the more stories that you hear, good and bad, the more that you can incorporate what they did, and especially the people that are incredible that, that, that you see as being successful into your daily routine, the better off that you're going to be. Fred, you're the man. You are the man, and you are a true power move maker. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your wisdom. And it just was a pleasure conversing with you. Where can people find you at? Uh, so right now I'm not on social media. I know I'm supposed to be on there. My publicist has told me. Um, so we're working on that, but right now I'm trying to kind of get the word out. I'm trying to, you know, I've, I've been blessed. I've been blessed with media takeout. I've been blessed that millions of people have supported my endeavors and I'm just trying to give back. So I'm going on as many podcasts as I can and just talking to entrepreneurs, particularly African-American men and women, because that's who, you know, who supported me from the get. And that's who, I think I have the most knowledge to give to. Um, so I'm going to be on podcasts as much as I can. I'm going to be um, going around and, and speaking and I'm not doing this for any money. I don't care about, you know, this is, this is just really about wishing that when I was starting the laundry service, you know, 17, 18 years ago, I wish I had someone that was as open 
about kind of the challenges of entrepreneurship and kind of the opportunities and rewards of it. And so that's all I'm trying to do. You know, Fred, um, I'm definitely going to call you offline because you just reiterated my entire mission statement. I'm doing this for no other reason than to give back because when I was coming up, you know, and God has blessed me with a lot of success over the years. Uh, he's blessed me to, to start from humble beginnings and make my way out. And I'm really trying to educate, inspire, motivate, and bring on as many people like yourself who look like the audience we're targeting, talk like the audience we're targeting, come from the same environment as the audience we're targeting and saying, hey, there is a way out legally. There is a way out through hard work, vision, passion, and just commitment to what you do. You can be successful. So I'm so happy to hear you say that. And I will absolutely hit you offline because, you know, I think that we're, we're, our, our reasoning for doing what we're doing is pure and it's coming from the exact same place. I love hearing that. All right. I, I appreciate it, man. My brother. Again, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Power Move Makers. Mr. MTO, media takeout himself, Fred M. Thanks. Be good, brother. All right, brother. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.